Hello everyone. <laughs> Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the final webinar of Prince 2 Primer, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University or CSU. My name is Guy and I'll be your MC and your mentor is Brenton Birchmore as you would know. As always before we begin some housekeeping uh, beginning with Zoom functions we ask that you direct questions directly related to the course material to the Q&A section for Brenton to answer and that you ask any administrative questions via the chat function. Just a reminder for those that are missed the start, we've we've also you've got the ability to to send chat to not only panelists uh, but also to all attendees, so you can chat amongst yourselves as well. On the exam for the course uh, next week, from the fourteenth, the the exam will be available to students. You will have until eleven fifty nine. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time on the 21st of November to complete it. You're required to complete all participation hurdles before the you can access the exam and earn your certification. And this can be done anytime before the exam period ends. But uh, of course we recommend not leaving this until the last moment because you'll not be able to sit the exam without having completed the homework and you might get a bit tight with time. The exam consists of 40 multiple choice questions which will have one answer, to, one hour to complete. Uh, please note that the exam can only be attempted once, unlike the other quizzes for the course. It is an open book test and you can save your progress, but the hour, can't, hour countdown can't be stopped once it's begun. Therefore, uh, yeah, don't attempt the exam until you're pretty sure that you're ready or as ready as you're likely to get before the end of the exam period. A reminder email will be sent out uh, once the period opens and if you have any technical difficulties please email us as soon as you can at shortcourses at itmasters.edu.au uh, There's a lot more information on how do I qualify for a certificate link um, uh, Sorry, there's a lot more information uh, on the course page under how do I qualify for a certificate and I'll, I'll, I'll send the links to that in the chat in a moment once you've completed the course, we would really appreciate if you have a, a couple of minutes extra to have a look at uh, the course satisfaction survey, which is found at the bottom of the IT Masters course page for this course uh, underneath week four content. This quiz contains a few questions related to the short course and takes only a few minutes and your anonymous answers will be reviewed at the end of the exam period by the IT Masters administration team uh, so that we can try and improve the short courses in general. Uh, your feedback is actually quite valuable and it does help make future courses better. So if you're taking lots of short courses, maybe let us know what you think you might like to improve. There's also information for those interested in further study in, on, at CSU and IT Masters. Um, and don't worry, um, Brenton's going to cover off uh, the exam again at the end of the webinar. So there's no need to ask questions yet. If you've missed anything, uh, he'll cover those off at the end. But for now, please welcome Brenton. Thanks very much, Guy. Hello, folks. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Where am I? There's, there's me. Right. Sorry, I just got to move the window over. Hi, welcome back. We are at the end of the road, the last webinar, the last discussion, the last chat. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in for this last discussion. we have uh, going to talk about processes today, which is kind of the meaty end of what Prince2 is all about. But we're going to pick one, uh, go a little bit deeper into it. Uh, you might know we've already sort of done that. We did that sort of sneaky like last week, uh, but we're going to go through a, another one and talk about it in a more detailed way. Some of this pretty particularly Prince 2 in nature. There is pre-recorded audio uh, that's up there now. Um, there's another uh, audio lecture up there covering another process, but um, we've only got the four topics. We're not going to be able to provide all the processes. So if you're wondering why haven't we got all of the other processes up there, well, that's what we cover in the full subject. Uh, so yeah, you kind of need to get into the university subject to get all of the stuff, but uh, hopefully this gives you an idea of how to go about this and how to interpret the information. If you, perhaps if you grab the book and you read more about processes that uh, you'll be able to make more sense of it and figure that out. So, before we do this, I want to ask your opinion on something. Uh, this is a question about how much you might be wishing to, or if, if it's your decision, how much would you intend to do more with Prince 2 based on what you've learned so far? Uh, do you think, well, yeah, it's kind of nice, but it's not really for us? 
Do you think that, uh, well, there might be some things you could do, but perhaps not much. Uh, it's got value, perhaps, uh, the, the middle ground. Uh, it's got value, but, or are you thinking that actually there's a lot in Prince 2 that you might be embracing? Or the best option, Prince 2 all the way. So this is just to get, uh, to share with you each other as well, how you're feeling about whether or not you can or would or should or wish to adopt some of what Prince 2 does. And I'm not saying become a Prince 2 house entirely. I'm saying perhaps you might want to embrace the principles. You might want to do things in a more Prince 2 themely manner. You might have a couple of the processes that you want to do or start doing. Uh, that you might do lots of other things other ways, but you might think, you know, we, we really should be managing our stage boundaries better. Let's grab the Prince 2 process and do that. So these are all just examples of how you might want to do more uh, and use more of Prince 2. Uh, you might have already planned to, uh, that's fine, but it, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of this will be on the basis of what we've covered and uh, hopefully what you might have learned along the way over the last few weeks. Uh, so where are we up to, Guy, with our voting count? Almost all have voted, and I'll just share the results. We've got 43. There is a lot in Prince 2 that we should be embracing. That's oh, a, a big percentage. Yeah. So, so okay, that's, well, that's huge. Uh, that means that really there's a lot of you that feel, and you can see that there's a lot of people amongst you that feel that there is value here. Uh, there is useful things in Prince 2. And it's kind of not surprising. It's, it'd be surprising if there wasn't anything of value, but you can see that uh, your peers, uh, those uh, here with you, are all generally feeling fairly positive that there's a lot of stuff in Prince 2 that they could, should, or might implement or embrace, even if, you know, just for you personally uh, in your career or your embracing of project management. All right. Is that shared? What do I need to click share? Guy, did you share that? No, that's been shared. Uh, okay, okay. Yep. So I've got, a, I've got a share button here, so I just wasn't sure if I needed to click that. But instead, I'll click the go away button. <laughs> yeah, click, click that one. All right. So what's in a process? Now, uh, process is a set of prescribed activities. Uh, it's stuff that we do. And, you know, we... We might look at a process as a sequence, and yes, some things have a sequence to them, but in Prince 2, it's not as much about the sequence as it is about a checklist idea. It's about making sure you get certain things done. Uh, it's about ticking the boxes and making sure that you've asked all the right questions. And this is really a, a common idea right through Prince 2. It's making us ask the right questions. So the process components, the things you have in Prince 2, firstly, every process has its purpose. And this is a simple statement in every case. It's maybe just a paragraph. And it's meant to be fairly simple, but it's one of the most significant uh, components of any process because that's the one thing you cannot betray. So Prince 2 says, yeah, you can play fast and loose with a lot of stuff, but we really must have the processes adhering to their true purpose. So when it comes to all the tailoring and all the stuff that we might want to tweak around the edges, this is sacred. This is the reason for the process. So if you look at uh, the process we talked about that we snuck in there last week, the startup, when we talked about startup as being the things we do before we decide whether or not we've got a, a project, whether or not we should invest, whether or not we can rubber stamp this. Now, the reason for that process is to say, well, we need to have all of the pre-project information together to decide whether or not we can formally go to the next step of initiating because initiating is where we make a bunch of decisions we get lots of people in a room and we do lots of exciting stuff but before we spend all that time and effort we need to know that that's the right thing to do so the purpose of that process that we covered last week is pretty clear and you might go about the whole method of determining whether or not you start a project in different ways but that purpose, that thing must happen. That's what Prince 2 says. Now, it then breaks that down into a little more detail. So the process, the purpose is just a simple statement, but the objectives are literally a list. And these are the list of the things that the process should achieve. This is the goals of the process, what it's trying to result in. So whilst the purpose is this uh, lofty goal, the objectives are an itemization of that. It's sort of saying, well, what does this purpose really mean? Well, we've got to have this, we've got to have this, we've got to have this, we've got to have this. Uh, 
and some of them are longer than others. Some of them have you know, 10 or so objectives, and some of them only have a half a dozen. So these objectives help define in more detail what we need to have at the end of our process. The context is the thing that helps us understand where that process fits in relation to everything else and all its other processes. Now, there's seven processes, not a lot, but they work very tightly together and they work somewhat specifically together. So the sequencing, the timing and the, the order of things happens in between the processes. When you do what process is kind of important. When you do each an individual thing in the process is kind of not important. Well, it is, but it's not important to Prince too. It might be important to us and we'll make the decision of in what order we do the actions or the activities necessary. But the sequencing of the processes, that's got some important logic to it. So then we have the actual activities. So the activities is the things we've got to do. Now here, what Prince 2 does is it describes activities and actions as separate things. It sounds a bit confusing, but activities and actions, what Prince 2 is trying to say is that the activities are the holistic description of the actions that should happen. The action description is recommended. So you could look at it another way. You could say the activities are what needs to happen and the actions are recommended things that underpin that. Now, the actions themselves are a subcategory of activities. They're not a component of processes in and of themselves. They sit under activities. So a number of actions might be necessary to fulfill one of the activities. But these are the recommended actions. We can do other things. We can do it our way. That's why it's the how method of how we go about achieving these activities. Some of this will make more sense for some of you when we go through this next example, which we're going to talk about project initiation. But then at the end, the last component in describing a process is the tailoring guidelines. Now, to be fair, this is fairly similar from one process to the next. There's a lot of similarities in the guidance that they give. They say, well, if it's a smaller project, you think about this. If it's a more agile project, you think about this. If it's under a program, you've got to think about this. And there's a very strong echo with that guideline and that advice between all the different processes that we cover. So we're not going to go through those in great detail in this discussion today because that similarity is the guideline of say, well, here's the sensible things to think about when you change the scale of your project or you change the nature of the project. But they're just guidelines. It's a way of helping us understand and interpret what we might need to think about. But when you see the tailoring guidelines, a lot of it is going to be very logical and obvious and it's going to make sense. I think, well, of course you think about it like that. So they don't form the same pivotal structure as all the other components do in the process itself. So here is an overview of the process in a very simplistic manner. This lines it up in terms of the life cycle. So you can see across the bottom is the life cycle of the project. Now in Prince 2, the life cycle only has, really has three stages. And we've talked about these stages before. There's an initiation stage, and there has to be. There's management stages. There has to be at least one. There may be several. And there's a final stage. Now the final stage is the final management stage the last management stage. Lots of things, all the same sorts of things happen in the last management stage as would have happened in all of the other stages before it, other management stages, but in the final stage, an extra thing happens, which is the closing of the project. So you can see here, the pre-project stuff is the startup of a project. That's the process we talked about last week. That happens before we've actually officially got a project, but it's still a Prince 2 process. You can see across the top, directing a project, that's something that happens throughout the life cycle, even in the final stages. But it hasn't yet begun at the pre-project stage because we don't yet formally have a project until that's approved. So it's the project board that says, yeah, we'll approve this project. Oh, and we are directing it. That's our job. That is the project board's job. So in the initiation stage, you have the initiating a project. 
Then you have controlling a stage, managing delivery. So you can break up this guideline to say, okay, we've started a project, that's a process. We have a process for directing it on an ongoing basis. We have a process for initiating it. We have a process for managing a stage or controlling a stage. We have a process for the bit in between this stage and the next stage, which is managing a stage boundary. And we have a process for managing the delivery through each and every one of those stages and then a process for closing it off. So how do we work with processes in Prince2? So if there's only seven major processes, the important thing we have to remember, and this is an echo of what I said before, is that each one fulfills a major purpose. So let's go back again and quickly look at these from a purpose point of view. The purpose is we've got to do some stuff before we formally say we're going to run a project. That's the startup purpose. Whenever we start a project, we're going to make sure there's the governance, oversight, the controlled stuff in place. It needs to be properly supervised and directed at the top. We need a process that does that. We need a process that makes all the decisions about how we're going to do everything before we actually start doing it. Why? So that everyone's on the same page before we actually get going. So we need a process that does that. That's initiation. We need a process that manages how we're going to deal with everything in one particular stage. We need a process for managing what this team does, what that team does, what the project manager is doing and how all that's managing, how all that's happening. That's the managing the stage. Then we need a process that actually functions at the coalface. The one that says, well, this process controlling a stage is the thing that actually gets work done. This is where things are produced and all the millions of ants that we've got working away busily in our project are actually producing stuff under the controlling stage. But a stage has an ending. So we need to do something about that. We need a, a something that says, well, let's, let's stop and look back at all the things we did during our stage. Let's produce some reports. You know, we love reports. Let's produce some reports. Let's stare at these reports. Let's have some meetings about it. Let's have a discussion. Are we still on track? Is it within budget? Is it within this? Is it within that? Check what our tolerance is. Well, do we continue? We need a process that does that. It makes us stop and look and check and ask. Many of us have had or seen projects that we wish we'd done more of that. So Prince2 says, yes, we've got a process for that. And then at the end, well, we don't just sort of finish it and walk off and say, right, where's the next project? We've got to wrap things up. You know, we've got to draw some lines under the accounting. We've got to make sure that everyone's happy. And so there's a process for that. So what Prince2 is trying to say is that we've got a logical breakdown of all the things at a macro level that need to get done in the case of a typical project. So Prince2 has said, there are seven major things that need to happen in a project. And we're going to call them processes and we're going to then tell you a bit more about them. So the first and golden rule is that the objective and the purpose of the, any process is what it's all about. That's, its, that's where the whole methodology and the design of Prince2 has come from. It's come from saying, well, there's something that's got to happen. So you can be flexible with pretty much everything else but that. But this also means that we don't blur the lines between them unnecessarily. We don't want to have one process kind of taking over too much of the role of another process. I mean, we're talking about a project. There's a million decisions that get made in a project and, you know, another million things that happen, plus or minus a million typically. So of all the things that go on in a project, Prince2 has broken it down into only seven real clear goals, only seven things that actually have to happen. You can't get much simpler than that, and we probably shouldn't. So Prince2 says, don't blur the lines. Don't let the wrong thing happen in the wrong process. Keep it lined up the way it should be. Other than that, play fast and loose. Tailor what you need to. Make it work for you, for your project. But this, even whilst you do all of that, we're not only remaining true, obviously, to the purpose of each process, but like everything else in Prince2, we have to remain true to the principles of Prince2, which is what we covered in week one. Kind of goes without saying, but we'll say it anyway, because Prince2 says it all the time. So we can think of this as a, a high-level checklist of all the stuff that we need to do and think about 
and make sure that it's all handled for our project to be successful. Here's the process list. Let's go through them in a little more detail and just list them off. There is starting up a project that we've already talked about last week, determining whether or not we should authorize and mandate a project. That's gathering the required information and having the required discussion to make that decision. Directing a project, once it's actually officially exists, that is having and doing all the things we need to do to make sure that the project board is in charge. That's above having the project manager in charge. That's a different process. This is the project board. This is making sure the executive is effectively in charge, not nominally in charge, not just in charge on paper, but is actually able to make the controlling decisions that are necessary. Initiating a project is where we make all the decisions about how we're gonna do everything. So this is often guided by the process of directing a project. Because the directing will say, well, this is the executive might say, this is how I want it done. So those people will be involved in initiating a project process to the executive, the final decision maker of the project might have some things to say about how it gets done. And we might have to listen to him or her in what they need. But there's going to be lots of other stakeholders and we'll go through, we'll go, this is the project process, we'll go through a little more detail today. Controlling a stage, this is where you actually assign work to people you monitor that work and you deal with whatever happens. Issues happen, uh, risks that occur, all the things we need to do to keep workflow on track. That, this is the workflow process, controlling a stage. Managing delivery is essentially controlling the tracking of all this work in between the different teams. So this is the thing that puts the project manager in charge of the day-to-day. This is the thing that enables the project manager to be in charge and enables the team managers to be in charge of their thing. Ensuring that the project manager is in charge of his or her thing, which then ensures that the project board can be in charge. So it's creating this connection through the hierarchy that says, well, project board is here. Managing delivery says, well, now we've got the project manager and the project team doing this. And this is how we structure it. So that's its job. Managing a stage boundary. This is the process where we stop at the end of a stage and look back and say, how do we do? Lots of important questions. Uh, for those of you who, I mean, I have actually done a audio recording. So for those of you who are curious, I have put up a pre-recorded audio on initiating a project and on managing a stage boundary. And I chose those two because those two are very Prince too. Uh, these are things that I think are two of the most valuable processes that the Prince 2 ideology brings to project management. Uh, you can control a stage in many ways, and it's kind of obvious that we need to. It's kind of obvious we need a governance oversight in directing a project. Um, so I put managing a stage boundary up there for you guys because I thought uh, there's room to give you two, uh, and uh, that's a pretty important one, I thought. Closing a project, uh, it's perhaps not too different to what you might have expected with lots of other methods. It's about formally accepting that we're done. And what does that mean? Have we realized the benefits? Uh, have we closed all the accounts? Have we finalized everything? It can include things like, you know, making sure that people get reassigned to other tasks uh, and all sorts of things. So that's the list of processes. Now, before we go on to talk about, I'm going to show you this picture, um, this diagram. This, this lays out the sequence of activity in a little more detail. It's kind of similar to the last one uh, diagram that we looked at. Now, these diagrams are all taken from the Axelos book, the book that we recommended to you. Uh, so for those of you who've got this, you might have seen this. It might look familiar. Uh, or for those of you who will one day, this is where you'll find it. Uh, so you can see that there's this difference on the left here. I want to talk about the left column, the very left one where you have delivery management direction and the corporate program management. So at the very top is the customer. Now that could be the corporation that we all work for. It could be some other organization. It could be the program that our project is part of, but it's the highest beneficiary that we have in this process that we are connected to. So a standalone project might be working for the organization itself, but a grouped project might be part of a program. 
that's the highest entity that we will relate to as a project. The direction layer is essentially an oversight, governance, and control layer. That's the layer that says, we're making the decisions here, and this is how we do it. That's the project board's uh, existence in the direction layer. That doesn't handle the day-to-day. -day. The direction handles the big stuff that happens in between important things, and it handles big things like exceptions. Now, exceptions is a, a word that simply describes things that are outside of the boundaries of what we expected. You know, being off the scale, outside of normal acceptable parameters, or is projected to be, which means it's going to be one day if we don't do something about it, so let's do something about it. So those are the sorts of things that the direction will handle. Then you've got management. Now management, you see lots of processes going on here. This is the, the meat, the nuts and bolts of project management as a whole. So this middle section, is where you have things like initiating a project. I mean, this is where the project manager lives. Project manager is going to be handling the initiating of a project. It's going to be responsible for it. It's going to be responsible for managing a stage boundary. And you can see the arrows here. I don't know if you can, I don't know if the resolution is good enough, but I'm hoping you can see the arrows. Uh, so you can see the startup says, okay, we think we've got a project. So we request it. We request to initiate. That goes up to the people that decide and in, in the directing level. And they say, yeah, all right, here's your authority. We're going to initiate a project. Well, fuck it. Let's, let's go. Okay. Let's get, do a bunch of work. So initiate a project. Okay. We've done all that. Uh, we're now going to request to deliver the project. We've done our initiation. Here's all the things that we think are in it. That's all we can come up with. All right. Let's get a formal approval of that. Now we're going to say, right, we're going to manage a stage boundary, which is in between the initiating stage and the management stage. That's the first stage boundary. Not a lot has happened yet. That might be relatively brief. But then we say, okay, are we ready to go on? Are we ready to proceed? Have we got all our plans? We now need to create a next stage plan. Why do you have a manager stage boundary after you haven't actually done any work yet? Why would you have this? I mean, you might be thinking, okay, we haven't managed anything. We haven't delivered anything. We haven't even picked up a pencil. Why are we managing a stage boundary already? We've got nothing to report on. Because managing a stage boundary includes the process for planning the next stage. So, ergo, we need to have managing a stage boundary in there that says, well, uh, now we're going to plan the very first management stage. The stage plan, the thing that says, this is what's going to happen in the next six months. So that's why we need managing a stage boundary to occur, even though it's only following the initiation where no work has been done yet. Well, no outputs have been done yet. So we still need to request that the project board approve that stage plan. Great, approve it. That gets authorized. If there's exceptions, well, there aren't exceptions yet because we haven't actually delivered anything the first time. But next time, we'll be managing a boundary after one of our management stages. So there might be exceptions next time. So now we're going to go and have a management stage. Great, we're finally going to get some work done. Well, we've got to control that. We've got to manage how that works. So this is a cycle, okay? Goes down to manage delivery. Things get done, things get completed, things get initiated, things get completed. Now, sometimes you get alarm bells ringing in the middle of a stage. Whoa, hey, something's gone horribly wrong. Quick, call the boss, all right? Things go up to the project board. And the lightning has just struck. What do we do about it? Well, we, we, we get the project board to make a decision. And they give us advice. But usually, when we get to the end of a stage, which is approaching a stage boundary, up here, it goes back up here, we manage the stage boundary, we do a plan, and it goes back up and it comes back down. So here is another cycle. Depending on how many management stages we have. And then finally, we get to this, project end is approaching. We're saying, well, this is gonna be the final management stage. Now we say, okay, now we do the closing stuff. Recommend that we close the project. Oh, the boss says, the executive says, actually not yet. Uh, we want you to tack a few things on, you know, bit, bit of scope creep. Here you go, do some more. All right, we do some more. And then finally, it gets closed. So this is admittedly a very complex and, and lengthy diagram to look at. But this shows you 
really what gets done in the entirety of the PRINCE2 process model. Now, before I go on to the next stage, let's have another quick poll and then I'll take some questions immediately after this poll. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to throw a couple of them on there now. Uh, which of these characteristics of these processes appeals to you? What, what do you like about these processes? Uh, is it the fact that it's simple and it, it lets you handle the details? Is it the fact that there's a, a good focus on the interaction and the interdependence in between these various processes? And you can tick multiples of these. You don't have to choose your favorite. You can tick as many as you like. The third one is the emphasis on uh, the tailoring guidance. The fact that it gives us a lot of input on how we would adapt and, and be flexible with these principles, with these uh, processes. Uh, the fourth, uh, how the processes always tend to lean on the Prince 2's core principles. The fact that all these processes always come back to saying, look, it's underpinned by these seven principles. Or is it perhaps the clear accountability and the involvement that it brings for all the stakeholders? Is that the thing that, that really shines for you? But like I said, you can choose more than one. This is a way to let you all decide what you feel is positive and good about these processes. And at the same time, you know, if you have a thought that you've got a question you want to ask, I'm just going to look at those questions just while you all tick a few more there. And we've got about two thirds having voted already. And 60% of people like the, the accountability and involvement it brings for all of the stakeholders. It's uh, clearly the most popular, good 15% over emphasis on tailoring guidance for different projects. Yeah, look, I wonder, I wonder if that's an echo of the fact that Prince 2, and actually this, this goes back to a question that Dhruv has asked, so I'm going to answer that one. How do you enforce managing a, a stage boundary? And it's, it's a really good point, and I think I feel that this is what's echoed here in what people are responding in this poll. Prince 2 keeps the senior people in line far better than lots of other processes and methodologies do. That's my view. Prince 2 is one of those things that says, well, you've all got to do it my way. I'm Prince 2, you all toe the line. Boss or not, this is how it works. So if the mandate is, okay, we adopt this process, we're Prince 2, it's a way of saying, well, boss, if we're Prince 2, you've got to come to this meeting and you've got to make sure that, you know, you've got to sign off on this because that's how we do things here because we're Prince 2. So, that's where you get some of your leverage and some of your mandate to get the right stakeholders at the right meetings, in the right discussions, doing the right things, signing or replying to the right emails, etc. cetera. Um, so, I mean, that's somewhat of a simplistic answer to, to Drew's question, but uh, I think that how you enforce it is by making sure that before you even begin the project, you have gotten the buy-in from everyone that says, well, this is how we do things. We are going to have this kind of discussion at the end of the stage aren't we? All the people in the project board, aren't we Fred and Mary? Yes, we are. Right. Okay, good. Now actually enforcing it, obviously, you know, if you have to carry a baseball bat to work, then you know, whatever method works for you, but that's the preamble that gives you something to work with when it comes to enforcing it. Sports as team building. Yes. 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 Well, you know, baseball bat or cricket bat, depending on your, your preference in sport. <laughs> How long you've got. Uh, right, so we're sharing those results now. As I said, 60% clear accountability involvement. Uh, and, and yeah, the emphasis on tailoring second in there. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, just a quick one, Brenton. Um, in the chat, there's uh, a couple of people have asked what the book was that you were talking about. Was that the Managing Successful Projects book about 10 minutes ago you were asking? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. All right. We we listed that somewhere in the portal, didn't we? Yeah, uh, that, that's the, in the that's in the course overview. So I'll just to, I'll just enter the the name of the book in the chat. Um, but you can also see there's a link to where you can purchase it. Um, I think it was the best price we found, wasn't it, Brenton? Um, not horribly expensive. It's mm, not cheap. Of course. I don't know. What is it? 80, 85 euros or something. It was or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I think that's don't don't quote me on that. It's a, just from memory, but. Uh, that's the book that we're, that's the book for Prince 2. Uh, so that's what you need to be looking at if you want to get serious about it. And uh, I think, yes, you, you can get a digital copy. I've got a digital copy. Of course you can. It, it's, uh, mine's on Kindle. So you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle. You can probably get it on lots of other ways as well. All right. 
let me see if there's any other questions that we want to grab here. Um, the question of where is planning as per PMI fit into prints too? So planning. Okay. So let me specifically tackle the question on planning. There is a project plan and there is stage plan. It's a little more than that, but let's focus on those two. The project plan is the thing that we create during project initiation. That's the thing that we create that says, here's all the stuff that we're going to do for the entirety of the project. Here's the macro perspective. That's the thing that says, in this stage we do this, and in this stage we do that, and at the end we'll have this. So that all gets decided as a, as a major plan in project initiation. But then you look at a stage plan, and that only happens during the stage boundary phase. So during the stage boundary process, we plan the next stage. Now, we might already have a bit of an idea and we probably should have half of that kind of fleshed out maybe. I'm not saying we have nothing and we start from scratch. We've probably got some idea of what should go into it, but we don't formally rubber stamp that stage plan until we have the process of managing a stage boundary that says, all right, now here's exactly what we're going to do because we've learned lessons from the last stage or the last couple of stages we're taking all that into account and now we're planning the detail of that next body of work. Now a stage might be three months, one month, six months, could be a year potentially. It all depends on the scale and scope of our project, but it's going to be some amount of time. And if we have several of these, then that's the point where we stop and do the next level of planning. So those of you who are familiar with waterfall will notice that this isn't a hundred percent of planning up front. This is, a lot of the macro planning up front, but it makes room for some subsequent planning and some corrections to that plan at a slightly larger scale than you might do with other methodologies. But it's not fully agile where you're kind of making a decision every two weeks about what you're going to do or three weeks or something. And, you know, you kind of decide on every day what you're going to do. It's not that flexible, or at least it's not telling you to be that flexible, but it doesn't say you can't. It doesn't say you can't use these ideas to work with either take your waterfall and break it up into delivery phases or to take your agile and for example, look at the end of a sprint a little bit like managing a stage boundary. So it, it doesn't say you can't do that. What else have we got? Uh, Lenore is asking current chart. Britain is, is presenting now shows processes overlapping. Did I have process? Let me, let me check that. That's a good question. Let me go back. Is this, this one, Leonora? I'm, I'm guessing this is the one you were talking about. Uh, that, that's when it came up. Yeah. That's when it came up. Okay. All right. So, okay. So let me clarify what I mean. The processes themselves don't overlap, but some of them happen concurrently with each other. The activities, what I mean by overlapping, okay? The things that are done as part of controlling a stage remain as part of that stage. Some of it will happen simultaneously with other processes, like the managing of the product delivery. So controlling a stage is the delivery of the work. Managing the delivery is managing the work. They kind of have to happen along the same time at the same way. But what I'm saying is, don't do the activities that you should do in the controlling a stage process and call them or make them part of your managing delivery process. So it might sound like semantics, but it gets more important when you look at managing a stage boundary. Now I said before that you're supposed to have managing a stage boundary after initiation, even though you haven't done any work yet, half of managing a stage boundary is retrospective. Let's look at the last management stage and see how we did. And the other half is let's look forward to the next stage and see what we need to do. Now the first part of that question, let's look at what we've just done. Well, if it's the very first one, you haven't got really much to talk about there because you haven't done anything yet, but you might be tempted to say, look, you know, let's just, let's move our stage planning and move it into the controlling the store and let's move it into managing product delivery. That makes more sense for us. We're going to do all of the stage planning that's meant to happen here. And we're going to put it down in here. Preach two says, don't do that. So that's what I meant by overlapping. Don't take stuff that you're meant to do here and do it as part of this or some other process. Keep this 
as a sacred process that says, this is the process that achieves this purpose. And everything that achieves that purpose is part of that process. And we're going to keep it that way. So in terms of simultaneous activity, that's not what I was suggesting that you avoid. Hopefully that's clarified. That makes it a bit more, a bit more, um, uh, so are the oval boxes sub uh, or, or thought of entity? So there's actually a, uh, there's actually a legend that uh, I, why don't I put that up on the, the, on the board. So the, these are flags. So these are activities that are going to occur. These are activities that occur in between processes, but there is a legend that I'll put up on the portal that shows in detail what all of the symbols are on these, all these uh, diagrams that I've given you. So that they are communications effectively. Triggers, well, technically they're triggers. Most of these ones shown here are communications, but technically they are called triggers. It's what you need to consider. It's a trigger that says, oh, this is happening, such as uh, where we're we looking at. Stage boundary is approaching. We're getting to the end. That's a trigger that says, well, we've got to do something about that. Uh, what else we got? When do we decide how many management stages are required? You decide that during the initiation. At the very beginning, when you're making your project plan, which is the macro plan that spells out the entirety of the project, that's when you decide how many management stages would be appropriate. Mark says, does project board supply end project criteria for the project manager during initiation? Yes, most definitely. You define not only uh, the end project criteria, but you define it in every way. You define it in terms of the scope, but you also define it in terms of benefits. And this is one of the things that's a little different about Prince2. Prince2 says, keep an eye on the benefits. So yes, the project board says, uh, here's what we want you to do. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's how we're going to measure the quality. And uh, this is why it's meant to be good for us. So keep an eye on that too. And all of that does get determined, recorded, and shared in project initiation, most definitely. Uh, it's not a content question, but I will answer Sarah's question. Has there been any clarity on PDU claiming uh, with PMI? How many which categories? Uh, we don't have a formal answer. Uh, it's not been uh, formally attached to the PMI list of, of courses because it's uh, not a recurring course. Uh, so it doesn't easily get uh, attached to that. But the advice that I've had is that uh, this sort of training absolutely should be uh, claimable on PDU. Uh, with PDU claims, generally you need to claim actual course time. Uh, so usually it's easy to claim time spent during webinars, time spent listening to audio, uh, but the extra study time that you might have done that's not considered classroom time, uh, you may not get a lot of that approved. So you might need to be conservative with the number of hours that you claim for online learning. Uh, that's just PMI's policy. Uh, but it's all just a matter of submitting a claim. And if anyone does submit a claim and get some answers, I'd encourage you to post it. Let us know. Let everyone else know. Yeah, and I'm I'm still following up, Brenton, with with CSU to see if we can expedite that process. Okay. Yeah. yeah but but haven't heard much back. There's a bit of admin in that, so I'm not confident yeah. that we'll get done yeah. soon. If if anything uh, changes, we'll let you know there. Yeah, but I would encourage you to go and claim. Uh, just try don't don't try and claim too many hours. Is my advice. All right, let's move forward. Uh, did we do this poll? Did we do this poll? Yeah, we did. Uh, initiating a project. Let's talk about the, the process uh, that we're going to talk about. The purpose of initiating a project, and we kind of already touched on it, but here it is in gold, is to establish the real solid foundations and clarity of all the things that are going to happen in this project officially, not kind of what we think might do. That's already happened. That's happened in the startup phase. Now we're being official. We're saying, Here's all of the details of the work to be done, all of the scope, the quality, how we measure it. Here is all of the, the way in which we're going to manage it. How we're going to manage risk, progress, everything. And we'll go through those details. And to understand what the commitment is required for this project. It's going to take this much. It's going to take this long. And this is how we're going to do it. This is who we need. This is what they need. That's its purpose, to get all of that clear. So let's look at the objectives. There's 10 of them. Yes, long list, fine print. There's 10 objectives. This is a pretty important process as far as Prince2 is concerned. There's lots of stuff in it. 
So here's an example of all this. This is all the sorts of things we need to do. We need to make sure there's a common understanding because remember the purpose is getting a clear foundation. So our objectives are to have a, a common understanding of at least these 10 things. So a common understanding of why we're here. That's the benefits, right? Remember I said before, the question came up, does the project board uh, define the requirements of project end? Well, part of the requirements of project end is, did we actually enjoy the benefits? And in that regard, this is one of the objectives of initiation, to spell that out. What are the objectives? What are the benefits? Because the benefits are the reasons for the project, as per the business case. So that then says, well, what's the scope of what's to be done and delivered? What is this thing? What, what, what is the work that we're going to do here? How are we going to deliver that scope? What's it going to cost us? Who is going to make all the decisions? That's the authority element. Who's got authority over what? Who makes what decisions? Uh, how are we going to manage quality? It's got to be fit for purpose. If it's not, it's not going to yield the benefits. How are we going to make sure it's fit for purpose? What are we going to do about that? How we, how we, we, oh, we've got a typo there. Look, I just, I just pointed out a typo. Everyone see the typo? There it is. Yes, I have a typo. How we will establish and control baselines. Uh, baselines. Now, this is starting to talk about themes, okay? So I'm going to go through the next couple, and I want you to remember, what did we talk about with themes? Uh, week two. How we manage risks, issues, and changes. How we monitor and manage process. That's theme stuff, right? So what we're doing in this process is deciding how we're going to manage all the things. What are the themes? The themes are the stuff that we've got to keep track of for the entire life cycle of the project. The themes of the project, things we've got to keep our finger on. And this is where we're spelling it out. We're saying, okay, we've got to get all this sorted out. We've got to decide how we're going to do all these things. All right, we're going to decide who needs what information, when they need it, how they need it, both upwards and down. And we've got to make it clear how this fits within the strategic perspective. So that's, you know, the parent organization or the program that it's part of. So that's the objectives. Lofty and powerful goals. Here's the context. So this is where it fits in the context of everything else. This is initiation. It's got a fairly clean spot to live in. It's fairly neat. It lives just after project startup. Okay, so we've got the authority that's come from project startup. Now that authority has come because there is now a directing in place. There is a project board. You can't, you can't have a, an initiation phase until the project board has said, we have a project. You can't have a project board until you've assembled that project board via directing a project. Does that sound like chicken and egg? Kind of. But a lot of what else happens in the directing process will happen ongoing and later. But initiation just need at least to get that authority in place from the project board. They give us the authority to say, right, you go and do all the work that says make all the decisions, get ready. So then we do all these things and this is where it sort of spells it out in a little more detail for us. A little bit of a sequence here, but you can see there's lots of things we can do in parallel that we can do at the same time and we have a choice over. Now, at the end of this, we're going to get a formal request that says, here's our PID. Can we do this? We get that formally approved. And then once it is approved, and if it's not approved, we rinse and repeat. We go through and make new, the, boss, the board says, look, no, don't like this, not happy with that, got to do this better, whatever. That might happen a few times. So we get all that clean, neat, tidied up. Then we are approaching a stage boundary when the project board says, yep, I like to look at this project and how you've defined everything. Let's get on with it. So we manage a stage boundary, which at this stage is mostly to do with planning the first management stage. So what are the activities? Now, yes, there are recommended actions under most of these, uh, which we're not gonna go through because uh, it'll take too long. But these are the initiating activities that we need to do. So this is the stuff that needs to get done. 
Now, the actions were the recommended ones that Prince 2 says, yeah, you probably should do it a bit like this, but you don't have to. But this is the stuff that actually needs to be done. We need to agree on how we're going to tailor this project. We need to have a risk management approach. We need to have a change control approach. We need to have a quality management approach, communications management. Are we seeing some themes here again? Yes. This is what this is doing. A little bit more than themes because they're saying, well, we've got to set up the project controls. Well, actually, no, that is part of themes, right? The authority of the organization, keeping track of the organization of the project. We've got to create the project plan. That's the big one. You know, there's this big high level macro project plan that says this is everything. It's not all the details, but it's certainly all the big things. And now that we've got so much more information, we've asked and answered all these questions, maybe we need to refine the business case. Maybe we've got a thing that says, well, now that we know so much more, it's going to cost us more. It's going to take longer. So maybe we refine the business case that says, oh, if it's going to cost more or take longer, uh, maybe we need to add this to it or do this differently or it'll have an effect. It'll have an effect on the value of the benefits. Is it going to be worth it? Maybe it still is, but maybe we need to refine the business case. And at the end, write it all down. Actually, all the way through, but we end up with the project initiation document, the PID. Now, I'm going to grab some questions if there are any, not yet. Think of some questions if you have any about what we've just covered. What you've just covered is the initiating a project process. What that means is you can follow a very similar mentality when you look at various other processes. Another one that I did, as I mentioned, I recorded was managing a stage boundary because I find that to be one of the particularly cool things about Prince 2, making us look at a stage boundary. Um, it's one of the things that makes Prince 2 much more effective at managing or uh, overseeing more agile projects than other methods might do. But hopefully you've got a, a bit of a guide as to how you, what, what a process is and how you work with it. But ultimately you're going to have a lot of freedom about how you chop and change all of this. So what we've covered today, we've talked about the fact that processes do have some strict requirements. They have some things that are sacred, like their purpose and their objectives. They have some things that say, well, don't blur the lines between them. This belongs here, this belongs there, because you need to adhere to the purpose. We know that these processes all work together, one before the other. They feed into each other, they rely on each other, and they also work very closely with the themes and the principles. We know everything has to work or be subservient to the principles. That's kind of been drummed into us by now. But you see here, just as what we covered, the themes then come to shine as we start to make the day-to-day -day decisions, we start to make the initiating decisions and said, well, this is how the themes are actually going to work out. So here we work out the tolerances. So when you look at the stage boundary uh, and you listen to that audio, it'll talk about exceptions. What do you do when you get an exception? What's an exception? Well, that's been defined based on the boundaries that were agreed upon in project initiation. Cause that's where we said, this is the boundary of quality. This is the boundary of cost. This is the boundary of these different things. And then the reporting at the stage boundary says, we're not on budget. We're not on time. Or we are, but if things keep going like this, we won't be. Both of these are things that we've got to do something about. And maybe get some advice from the highest level of authority that our project has, which is the project board. So you can see how these all sort of work together with the themes and the principles. Um, the project initiation and uh, project boundary discussions are very Prince 2. And uh, this is why I've given you these two, because I think they're some of the most interesting parts of it. And hopefully also you, you've got a bit of an idea now that, you know, this is, it's designed to not cover everything itself. It's designed to make sure that we cover everything. It really is about making sure that we ask the right questions. Big focus of what Prince 2 is all about. Uh, let's see if there's any questions uh, before, we, before we go into a quick poll. Uh, why is all the time iteration in the process? Project seems to never finish. No sequences, one, two, three. Why we close the project before we deliver the deliverable? Okay, so the question there is about, let me go back to that diagram. Okay, where, 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 where. okay so there are loops here. This might help explain it. 
startup happens first, but then initiating will happen. So that's kind of sequential, but there's a loop with here, managing a stage boundary, controlling a stage direct. This is, this could happen several times. So these are triggers and the timing of this, this isn't specifying the timing of it. This is specifying what connects to what. So this is the connections essentially, or what leads to what. You might go through this 10 times before you finally decide that this project end becomes relevant. So the sequence of exactly what happens in what order, the ordering of it is determined by Prince2. The timing of it depends on our project. We decide when this closing will occur. We decide which management phase will be the last one. But obviously it's not gonna happen before these other things, it'll happen later. So there's a loop here and there's a loop here between controlling a stage and managing product delivery. That's gonna happen on an ongoing basis, each management stage that we go through. So don't look at this as a timeline. Look at this as a cause and effect. Uh, the question, managing a stage boundary versus managing a project plan is something similar to agile releases and planning. Yeah, it, it is. I think release planning in agile lines up very nicely with managing of project stages because in a release plan, you're assessing the value and you're questioning whether or not the value requires major strategic decision changes to the vision even of the project. That's, that's what happens at the end of a release in agile. And that's synonymous with what happens at the end of a, a management stage and the managing a stage boundary. You ask the big questions, but a sprint probably is more of what happens in managing product delivery. This is where you say, this is where you're managing work, you're managing a sprint. That's work management. So I would agree release management is probably more synonymous with managing a stage boundary. Steve's asking why embed a change approach, uh, for example, a change policy if process already exists. Uh, I'm not totally, let me try and interpret the question. Why embed a change approach, uh, for example, if change policy already exists? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna make some assumptions about the question. Tell me if I'm wrong. Let's assume the company already has a change management approach and you have a way of going about managing change. Uh, this is talking about how do you manage changes to the scope? So this is change control, not change management. So change control is about saying, well, we're meant to build this, this, and this, and now we need to change that because various things, now we've got to build something different. So change control is about how do we go about making sure that that's managed in a careful way because that's going to affect lots. It could affect our risks. It could affect our budget. It could affect our timeline. It could affect our scope. It could affect our quality management because we're now changing the scope of work. We're changing what we're doing. So that kind of control is what we're talking about as a change. So we're not talking about change management of saying, well, how do we get the people and the organization to change its culture and its process and its mindset about doing something? That is a different part of change. Uh, Gary says, uh, if initiating a project process refines the business case, uh, when and where is the business case developed? So the business case is developed in two stages. Uh, it is firstly developed Primarily, a lot, the heavy lifting is done during startup. Because if the business case doesn't add up, you don't invest the time and effort needed to initiate. So the, the heavy lifting of the business case is done during project startup, where you find out, is it worth it? And you present that to the board and the board says, yes, it's worth it. I like your business case. Now go to the next stage and refine it. Check your assumptions is basically what that does. So your startup can't work with all the facts because it's, it's too cost prohibitive to invest all the time and effort to get all the answers. So you get some idea in your business case and you might list your assumptions. And then when you get to the actual initiation, you'll be checking those assumptions. And if the information you get challenges the assumptions, you might need to refine the business case. Go back to the board and say, eh, you know how we said that it would give us extra market share in two years? Yes, no, no, not going to quite work like that. We've learned a few things. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Uh, what do we got? Uh, okay, so question is, Prince2 meant to replace PMI or be used in conjunction? I would say that uh, it would be used in conjunction. Now, if 
an organization is very strong on their PMI methodology, uh, a lot of these processes will be done according to the PMI methodology, whereas PMI makes it a bit easier to adhere to a standard. This doesn't give you enough detail to actually have a standard. I did do a pre-recorded audio that probably covers that in a little more detail. So I recommend if you haven't grabbed that, have a listen to it already. It sort of talks about where it fits with everything. But I'd say, yes, they can work to together. Uh, but they, you wouldn't work 100% of them. You'd make some compromises between them. So you'd use some PMI processes to do the purpose, to fulfill the purpose of what these, some of these PRINCE2 processes might work, might do. But if you're going to be PRINCE2, you make sure that whatever you do using the PMI standard, at least adheres or delivers on that purpose. Uh, it doesn't seem to provide a list of what we need to ensure to cover. It, it's a high level list. Uh, there are more details you'll find if you have a read, read of it with the actions. It goes in a little more detail than we've covered here. Errol's got a great question. Why, in spite of using PRINCE2, are uh, some projects failure? It is because of the initiating phase, property defender roles were not defined. Actually, uh, in my experience, the answer is politics. Um, the number one reason why, the, actually, there's the two big reasons why, in my opinion, uh, projects fail. One is the lack of or the lack of adherence to sound project methodologies of any kind. That is just not managing a project as well as it could have been managed is the number one reason for failure. And the number two reason, in my opinion, is politics. Because managing a project to success for the, for the benefit of the business is not on everyone's agenda. And uh, it's when those political uh, agendas come into play that the project methodology is tested and stretched uh, and our adherence and everyone else's adherence to it is damaged. That's usually the reason. Uh, and unfortunately, PRINCE2 doesn't give us any methodology or principle or process that helps to, to do too much. It tells us how to deal with politics other than to say, if you're going to be PRINCE2 and uh, you want to adhere to that, then you've got to do some certain things. So it kind of helps a little bit, but it won't stop the, the political train. Everyone says, starting a project takes longer than initiating a project. Is this a correct assumption? Um, I wouldn't always agree with that. I think uh, when you get to a startup, it's a business case discussion. And sometimes you can have a, a pretty self-evident situation where you can, okay, well, uh, our competitors have just released a brand new widget and we don't have one at all. And, oh my God, we're losing customers to them hand over fist. We've lost 20 customers to them in the last week. We need to develop a new widget that does something similar that may become very self-evident. And so the project startup might be project board hastily getting together to say, how quick can we have this new widget? And that can happen. And you might just immediately go to project initiation that says, go figure it out. Or, you know, you might get some fanciful idea that no one's quite sure if it's really going to be successful or not. And you might have a very lengthy argument about whether or not it's actually worth it. So it entirely depends. I wouldn't say that there's any hard and fast rule about it. Uh, how's that? What is project failure? A project that was cancelled doesn't have to be a failure. You can fail gracefully. Yeah, absolutely. Now you've got issues like uh, sunk cost that always makes it difficult. Sunk cost is an emotional element as well. So sunk cost has an emotional cost that we need to take into account. Uh, but then that usually stacks up against opportunity cost. So you can end a project that was a good idea at the time, was real well run, but for reasons outside of uh, obvious control, it's no longer appropriate to do it. And now the bigger problem is the opportunity cost of what else you could do with your time, effort, and money. And uh, the sunk cost is lower than the opportunity cost. So we can this project and start another one. Could also be because you've got a new CEO and he or she doesn't like the color. And so <laughs> the project gets canceled and a new one starts. That happens too, uh, as we all know. Uh, Stuart's asking, can't spot in the diagram, where's the fine tuning that you mentioned in, in the process? Is it across all of it? Every process has fine tuning because the process doesn't tell you everything. So I think when I mentioned fine tuning, I was referring to fine tuning. Is that what I was talking about fine tuning? If I'm clarify my context here, if I'm not in it, but if I'm talking about fine tuning a process, then Pritch 2 won't tell you. Uh, you've got to decide exactly how you do all these things. It's more of a checklist in some ways. From the project manager's point of view, it's more of a checklist. Uh, 
I mean, it's saying, uh, should Prince 2 be used right from the start as in project? Yes, I would. If you're going to do Prince 2, start with Prince 2. Uh, I would certainly agree with that. I think that's an important idea. Uh, yeah, if you can't, sure. But if you can, yes, I would do that. Uh, Sarah's got a good question. Uh, exam, can you pass the exam based on the webinar only uh, or do you need the recorded lessons? Well, with, there will be questions from the recorded lessons. And yes, there's lots of parallels and echoes of what I've talked about in the pre-recorded compared to what I've covered in the webinars. There's definitely lots of overlap. It's the same kind of stuff. But there will be some questions that, you know, if, if I've written the exam correctly and I'm going to try to, there'll be some questions that you're probably only going to get from the audio because otherwise at no point I'm doing the audio. It uh, doesn't mean you won't pass if you don't listen to the audio. You might, but it, you're going to have to get more of the other ones bang on in order to do so. So yes, there will be correct questions that are meant to be entirely from the audio. Not, not lots of them. More than, more than half will be from the webinars, but not more than two thirds. That's my goal anyway with this. Hopefully that answers that question. All right, let's, I think we've seven minutes over. I'm going to go back to uh, last poll, last quick poll, and then we're done. Of the four topics, which is the most valuable to you? Okay. Yeah, I'm asking you to choose one, but then I've given you a, all of the above. So you can, you can opt out of that if you like. Um, but if there was one that, that stood out for you, uh, I'd love to know about it. So tell me what you think. Then we'll talk about the activity for this week, the forum activity, and, uh, and we can wrap up. This question is for me, really. It's to help me understand uh, how I've structured this four-week course for you guys and how well you've, uh, how you've enjoyed bits of it uh, and what sort of stood out for you guys been most valuable. And it's looking like it's either all of them or we, if there's a winner, it's week three. Which is interesting because week three is the one week out of the four that we didn't go from the book and just give you the raw methodology. We, we put it in context and we talked about it rather than to it. So that's great. That's really good. Um, let's share that. All right, thanks. So the winner was all of them, which is, which is good. Really good news, but I'm really pleased to know that week three was a success for many of you. Uh, that's, um, that's very good. Thank you. All right, so let me close that. Uh, week four forum discussion. Consider a project. You know that bit already. Now, what I'd like you to do is discuss one of these Prince 2 processes that if you'd done it well or done it better, could have helped. So obviously, this is a, a project where something in the Prince 2 model either didn't, didn't happen or didn't work well or was never going to because you didn't have Prince 2 or whatever. But for whatever reason, it, it let the project down. Talk about that. Or talk about where something was done well and how it helped. And you might not have been Prince 2. You might not have even known that you were doing something that actually is described in Prince 2. But now you look at it and say, hey, that's what Prince 2 would have told us to do. And that really helped. Talk, you can talk about that. So it could be knowingly or unknowingly. Prince too, but talk about how it, it helped and was successful or comment on something else. And yes, you do need to have put something up on the forums for each of these four discussions. So if you're planning on getting your certificate and you haven't been doing the forum stuff, uh, there is a, a deadline. A uh, guy mentioned, I think you need to get that done before you can get access to the quiz, the final exam. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you to get onto that in the next few days, this week, weekend at the latest, uh, before you do it. So what you need to do for your certificate, you need to have completed the weekly activities in the forums and you need to have completed it before you can get in and finish the exam. So once the exam week is done, uh, you can't go backwards and then do the forums. You gotta do the forums first. Complete the question, the five questions. Now, someone asked before about, uh, is there a trial exam or, 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 or uh, sample questions? That's what these are meant to be for. You can go back and repeat these. You can go and find the answer. Uh, you're not tested. This is not part of your mark, but you need to have attempted it. And that's there to give you an, an idea of the way in which these questions are likely to be asked because I'm writing both. So I'm, I've written these quiz questions. I'm writing the other ones. So you'll know it's kind of along those lines, obviously different questions and slightly different stuff, but that's how you, what you can expect from it. So that will serve the purpose of being like a trial exam. Uh, so you do need to do the quiz, uh, but you don't need to attend the webinars, but if you do want to pass the quiz, you probably should be watching the recordings if you weren't able to attend. So the final quiz next week, uh, last slide recap. 
uh, it does cover all four topics equally. So there'll be stuff from each week. Uh, there are questions from the webinars and the pre-recorded earlier, which I've just mentioned. Uh, maybe a slight leaning towards webinar stuff, but then there's so much overlap that half of them you won't know whether it came from the, the audio or the webinar because it could have come from either. There are 40 multiple choice questions and you've got to choose the one most correct answer out of it and you have one hour to do it. Uh, I, I spotted a question. Guy, do you know, has there been an official word about the pass mark? The pass mark is made up of, it's a 50% course mark you need to, to pass. Um, so that can come either from marks from the exam or for the forum participation. Okay. So you just need 50% total. So if you get, uh, let's say, maximum marks from the forum participation, I think you'd only need 40% uh, from the exam. So, okay, so the the ratio of what contributes to what, do we have that up on the on the portal? Yeah, it's in the, um, it's in the, it? the course overview and frequently asked questions um, page on the learn.itmasters.edu.au page. You can get all the information there. So it's, you get, up to 10% of your mark from forum participation. Right. So the exam's pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, can we easily check which forum we've responded to? Uh, we should be able to. Yeah. That's a, that, that's a more interesting one. <laughs> um, the easiest way is to go to the, the navigation of, once you're at the, once you're in the course, you see there's a navigation pane on the right and you click on participants, find yourself and you can actually track your forum post from there. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's good. Maybe just did the mentors get that as well or any students? No, stu mentors can do that as well. Okay, cool. In fact, we can, we can check out what other students have been doing. It's been great. Uh, so right. that, that exam is the 14th to the 21st of November until midnight on the 21st, Australian Eastern Daylight Time for S. Varanasi. So it won't be up till next Tuesday. That's right. It's up, it's up for one week exactly. Not a minute more, not a minute less. <laughs> yep. Uh, and we will be sending an email once it is open. All right. Okay. So you'll all get that little reminder. Oh, and Stuart's just noted an even easier way to check the forum. Uh, of course, the, the course dashboard shows you the tick once you've posted. Thank you, Stuart. Oh, neat. All right. Um, we're at the end, folks. I was hoping to get everyone away on an early mark today. That didn't work. <laughs> but we had some great questions at the end. And uh, no, that was really good uh, and worthwhile discussion at the end. Sometimes the question is actually the best bit. Uh, you know, the stuff that mm. I think I want to hear about is, is not always as interesting as what everyone else wants to chat about, which is terrific. Thanks everyone for those questions and for participating. It's been really good. And um, thanks everyone for joining in and uh, for being here for the journey along the next, last four weeks. Uh, there's more stuff to come. If you're more interested about project management stuff, I will be back for another short course in a few months next year. Uh, second quarter, I think next year, we've got a, a short course all about project recovery. Uh, how to fix a project that has gone horribly, disastrously, terribly wrong. And uh, what do we do next? So there is a short course about that coming. You'll get an email about it because you're on the mailing list now and you'll get to know about it. So if you've got an interest in that, do come along and join that. Tell all your friends and we'll have a great time. Until then, unless I see any of you in any of the other subjects, if some of you perhaps enroll uh, in the near future, I may see you in some of the uh, full subjects in university and I hope to see you then. Until then, that's all from me now. Thank you and good night.